the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Welcome everyone, I'm Rabbi Paul Joseph, Director of Jewish Education for the 92nd Street Y, and this is a very special aspect of our Jewish Life and Culture program. Part of our effort to reach out to other audiences that are also here at the Y, and during the course of the year we try to bring music lovers into our Jewish Life and Culture programs, as well as those who are devotees of fine literature through our Poetry Center, and from the looks of our group tonight, uh, this has been a successful blending of, uh, of interests. Um, the format for this evening is that um, we will open the program with some uh, informal discussion. I've prepared some questions uh, for our speakers. Uh, we also will give you a sampling of the new translation that uh, we're here to hear about. And uh, we will also go into the life and uh, uh, experience of the author whom we all have this special interest in. And uh, after we've had a chance to share some ideas with you, I will open it up for house discussion and we'll take your questions from the floor. If you're sort of up front, I will repeat the questions for those in the back of the room so that everyone will know what it is we're inquiring about. And um, that should make it uh, a lovely evening, I hope. The trial, which we are here to learn more about tonight, was composed between July and December of 1914 and is, of course, widely regarded as Franz Kafka's most powerful and provocative work. It is the story of Joseph K., a bank employee who is arrested and brought to trial for reasons he never understands. Franz Kafka has been characterized by some as the greatest allegorical writer of modern times. On the level of the broad landscape, Kafka's stories deal with bizarre characters interacting in ill-defined patterns of relationship, while at the same time, the events entailing their interaction are explored by the author with intricate care and attention to detail out of which he constructs an elaborate vision of the human being as a creature caught up in a closed, imprisoning world. Kafka is possessed of what is sometimes called metaphysical imagination in the realm of literature, that is, the tendency to claim that there exists and to go in search of a clandestine reality which lies behind the manifest appearances of worldly order. If life is a riddle, and in this I suspect he has a very Jewish outlook, if life is a riddle, then it must also have a meaning. And it is this which he seeks to uncover. In the process of understanding Kafka and his writing even a bit better, perhaps we will all benefit in unexpected ways. I'm pleased to introduce my guests for tonight. On my right is Lee Haffrey, a writer and translator. Lee is a lecturer at Harvard Business School where he teaches the first year course in management communication. He came to Harvard from a position as staff editor at the New York Times Book Review and has taught literature and writing at Yale, Harvard, MIT. His publications include translations of novels and essays from the French and German. His author subjects are Franz Kafka, Peter Schneider, Marguerite Duras, Martin Walser, and others, as well as essays and reviews and interviews for his New York Times and other American and British periodicals. His most recent work focuses on the relation of communication skills to corporate ethics and on the ways in which case method teaching may foster that bond, a highly Kafkaesque enterprise. Ernst Paul, on his right, was born in Germany and left that country in 1933 at the age of 13 and reached the United States in 1938. He served in Africa, Italy, and Yugoslavia with the OSS and subsequently attended the New School for Social Research where he obtained his degree in 1948. His first novel, The Island in Time, published in 1951, dealt with Holocaust survivors. Survival in the American corporate structure was the theme of the 1957 novel, From the Dark Tower, while in The Absence of Magic, published in 1961, he presented a fictional portrait of one of Freud's disciples trapped in the ambiguities of his American exile. 
While working as an editor and translator for a major life insurance company, Ernst Powell contributed numerous articles and reviews to the New York Times, The New Republic, The Nation, Commentary, Partisan Review, Midstream, Judaism, and others. His award-winning biography of Franz Kafka was published in 1984 by Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud under the title The Nightmare of Reason and it continues to be available as a Jewish book club selection, Jewish Publication Society. Uh, his biography of Theodore Herzl, The Labyrinth of Exile, was brought out by the same publishers in December of 1989. Um, given this introduction, I'd like to uh, quote the following statement of Kafka's uh, in a letter to Oscar Pollock that he wrote in 1904, and Kafka declared, I think we ought to read only the kind of books that wound and stab us. We need the books that affect us like a disaster, that grieve us deeply, like the death of someone we love more than ourselves, like being banished into forests far from everyone, like a suicide. A book must be the axe for the frozen sea inside of us. And so to Lee Haffrey, I ask if the trial in your estimation fits that description of a book, a book worth reading. And moreover, does a translator allow himself to be affected by the literature he's working on? Does one dare to do it? Does one dare not to do it? <clears throat> I, yeah, I don't think one dares to do it, and I don't think one dares not to do it. I mean, it's this sort of tension. There is a, a challenge there, and that's really what persuaded me to do the trial was it seemed like the most difficult translation project available at the time. This was in 1987, some of you may remember, Schocken Books was sold to Random House. Schocken had the rights to Kafka in this country. Uh, and in celebration of that event, Pantheon decided to bring, Pantheon being a subsidiary of Random House, decided to bring out new translations of Kafka. Kafka had been translated into English originally in the 30s, most of the, the important, important work, and had not been retranslated since. So this seemed like an opportune time from the, the point of view of the publishing industry to do the translations over. And the translation of the trial was to be the first in a series. I had translated at that point, I think, two or three books and a number of essays, short stories by French and German writers. And this seemed like something one couldn't pass up. So I undertook it. And certainly, translating Kafka, uh, I don't know if I'm full of ice, but it, it was like an ax at times. And it, was not, it was not always a pleasant experience, I have to admit. When we were speaking uh, over dinner, you uh mentioned that you may have even somatized your reaction to your encounter with Kafka. Would you share that perhaps with the audience? Uh, what, I told, what I told Paul is that I, I was commissioned to do the translation in 88 and began it in November or so. I worked on it off and on over a period of about a year and delivered it to the publisher in late November of 89. I was in the midst of a semester at that point. I was very busy, so I think there were other factors besides Kafka at work, but <laughs> I got sick. You know, minor cold symptoms that stayed with me over a period of five months, and finally I went to see a doctor and said, you know, what's, what's going on? And after listening to me for about 20 minutes, he said, well, you know, I think we ought to test you for TB, which is what Kafka died of. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have TB. <laughs> right. Well, uh, Aside from the fact that it was a, a, a milestone in the publishing industry, was there a need for a new translation? Um, uh, and can we impose upon you perhaps to give us a, a sample of what it was you achieved, what it was you were striving for? Yeah, I can tell you what I was striving for. I don't know that I achieved it. I think there was a need for a new translation. The, the Muir translation which, of the trial, which came out in 1937, was... Uh, not the first translation of Kafka that they had done. They introduced Kafka to the English-speaking world in 1930 with a translation of The Castle. They, I think, discovered him for the English-speaking world and had translated a number of his works in the 30s and then on into the 40s. They didn't, the two, it was a husband and wife team. He was uh, an autodidact, a poet who liked to read Nietzsche in English and she was a classic scholar in, at Edinburgh 
and I think very good academically, and had done a lot of translation, mostly from the Greek and the Latin. And together, they, she, in her memoir, Belonging, as she wrote in 1968, described the method that they used to translate Kafka. He would do one half, she would do the other half of anything they were working on, and then they would trade and go over each other's translations, and the result was, I think, a, a fairly well-integrated product. But the two of them didn't have a whole lot of German. Neither of them had studied German in school. He hadn't been to school. Uh, so the, the German they picked up in beer halls in Prague, where they went in 1923, and you remember they started translating Kafka in 1930. They had translated other authors from the German and uh, had made quite a success of them. In, in one, one case, they referred to what they had done as a polished rendering of the original rather than a translation. And that polished rendering was a big success in Britain. It was a bestseller. And I think that what they did with Kafka was a sort of a mix. Uh, they tried, I, I do believe, they tried very hard to be true to the original but they also wanted very badly to be true to the English language. He, he can't say it, but I think the translation is pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't this is say unrehearsed. it because mine's the, next one. <laughs> <laughs> mine's the next one on the line. Right? Uh, it's, it, is, it reads very well, but it, is, it does not do justice to a lot of, of what makes Kafka work. And that translation has been in print with some revisions since, since 1937. There was a new translation done in Britain in 1977 uh, that made an attempt to correct the inaccuracies, the blatant inaccuracies of the Muir translation. And I think did that successfully, but in the process lost the sense of what it is that makes the English language a vibrant literary language in its own right. So that you've got on the one hand the Muir translation, which reads quite well, although I think at this point seems a little bit dated. The English is, is rather precious for the, the tastes of the 1990s. And on the other hand, this new British translation by, by Douglas Scott and Chris Waller that is, I think, faithful to what J.P. Stern, who introduced the translation, calls the, the, the lusterless informality of the original. But it doesn't, it doesn't read in, in English terribly well, which I don't think you would say of Kafka if you were reading him in German. Reminds me of a joke about a collection of the works of Shakespeare written or translated into Yiddish. And in the foreword to it, it says, translated und verbessert and improved. <laughs> <laughs> Would, would you give us a sampling uh, sure. of what we're up to these days? Sure. Actually, what I'll do, if, if uh, just briefly, I'll read the, the opening lines, uh, the opening line in the two other translations and then in my own version. And that'll give you, I think, a br at least a brief sense of what's going on here. The uh, Muir's right, this is the first line, someone must have been telling lies about Joseph K. for without having done anything wrong, he was arrested one fine morning. Now, the, the fine at the end of that sentence is an interpolation. It, is not, it does not appear in the original. And so Scott Waller in their translation eliminated, someone must have been spreading lies about Joseph K. for without having done anything wrong, he was arrested one morning. It is more accurate, more true to the original. What I found problematic about that is that in both cases, the important thing here is not the one morning. That is, that's not the crux of the opening sentence. What's more important is that he was arrested, Joseph K. was arrested, and that he hadn't done anything wrong. So I put the last at the end of the sentence, and my version reads, someone must have been spreading nasty rumors about Joseph K. because he was arrested one morning without doing anything wrong. And it goes on from there. I'll just read the opening couple of pages. I think they're probably the best known opening pages of, of any 20th century novel. The woman who cooked for Mrs. Grubach, his landlady, brought him his breakfast every morning around 8, but she didn't come that day. That had never happened before. Kay waited a little longer. From his bed, he could see the old lady who lived across the way and who was watching him with completely uncharacteristic curiosity. But then, being both irritated and hungry, he rang. Someone immediately knocked at the door, and a man came in, whom he had never seen in the apartment before. He was slim but solidly built. 
He wore a snug black suit trimmed with pleats, pockets, buckles, buttons, and a belt like traveling gear, which made it seem very practical, though you couldn't tell what for. Who are you? Kay asked, and quickly propped himself up in bed. The man ignored his question as if his presence had to be taken for granted, and merely said in return, did you ring? Have Anna bring me my breakfast, Kay said. Then he tried to figure out who the man might be, silently at first and by watching him closely and mulling it over. But the other didn't put up with Kay's observing him for long. He went to the door, opened it a crack, and said to someone who was evidently standing just beyond the door, he wants Anna to bring him his breakfast. There was low laughter from the next room. It wasn't clear from the sound whether several people hadn't joined in. And though that couldn't have told the stranger anything he didn't already know, he turned to Kay now as if he were making an announcement and said, it can't be done. Kay said, I wouldn't be so sure, jumped out of bed and quickly pulled on his pants. I'd just like to see who those people in the next room are and how Mrs. Grubach is going to account for this. It did strike him immediately that he shouldn't have said that out loud and that in doing so he had to some extent accepted the stranger's right to supervise his actions. But he didn't think it mattered at the moment. That's how the stranger took it though, because he said, hadn't you better stay here? I won't stay here or tolerate your speaking to me either so long as you refuse to introduce yourself. I meant well, the stranger said, and now he opened the door of his own accord. Kay entered the room more, sl more slowly than he We've intended. lost a mic. Well, I'll, I think I can probably do without. Kay entered the next room more slowly than he intended. At first glance, it looked very much the way it had the night before. It was Mrs. Grubach's living room, and there might have been a little more space than usual today among the furniture, linens, porcelain, and photographs that filled it to overflowing. Only it was difficult to tell right away, especially since the biggest change consisted in the presence of a man reading by the open window. He looked up from his book. You were supposed to stay in your room. Now, didn't Franz tell you that? All right, what is it you're after, Case said, and glanced from his new acquaintance to the man named Franz, now standing in the doorway, and back. Through the open window, you could see the old lady had, out of truly senile curiosity, moved to the nearest facing window to go on watching. Hmm. I don't want to interrupt. I want to let that sink in for a moment. But I also uh, want to offer a question with a, with a preamble, and this is for Mr. Powell. When we speak of great literature with a somewhat universal appeal, there's a tendency to want to leave the peculiarities of personal biography out of the question. The presumed anonymity, for instance, of Shakespeare poses few problems for most of his readers. And yet, in the case of Kafka, it has been suggested that he cannot be appreciated fully without resort to a little psychohistory and social <coughs> biography. But when the subject is a German-speaking Jew, a Bohemian in the Czech homeland within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a man beleaguered by his tormented relationship with his father, a gymnast with a chaotic love life, who composed his works in the silent hours between 10 at night and 6 in the morning in a passageway room in his parents' apartment above a Catholic church sanctuary, well, maybe we do need to hear something about this man. Could you, as a preeminent biographer of Kafka, tell us what one absolutely needs to know about Kafka, the human being? Well. That's a big order. Yeah. I don't think one really does need to know a hell of a lot about Kafka. But let me say that what I see him as is a genius. Now, there's a sharp distinction between a genius and a man of talent. Kafka is a true genius, a very rare phenomenon. First and foremost, with all the pathology that's bound up with it. Now that this pathology often elicits more interest than the genius is understandable. There are far more neurotics than serious readers around, but <laughs> the pathology was not that unusual, and I'm sure that right here in this room we can find problems similar to those Kafka was afflicted with. But no one has demonstrated his genius. Now, Unique or not, genius, like everything else, is structured by both the individual and the collective history. If Kafka had grown up as an Irishman or as an Eskimo or whatever, he might still have been a great writer. 
but he would have been an entirely different writer. Uh, we can, and he would, might have been neurotic too, but his, even his neurosis would have been different. What, in my opinion, shaped, no, no. What, in my opinion, shaped both his work and his life in decisive ways was that he was a Jew, that he was a Jew at the turn of the century, that he was a Jew in Prague, where he spent his entire life. These three factors uh, intersect, and yes, they do make him what he is. I am not sure that one necessarily needs to know the details in order to appreciate the uh, trial. For instance, you have just heard the first page of the trial. Uh, I have a feeling that anyone in Prague, Czechoslovakia, who one of these days will read the trial, uh, will consider Kafka the first true example of socialist realism, because that is exactly the feeling they had uh, for 50 years, that somebody, for no appreciable re reason, came in, picked them up, and, uh, and arrested them uh, without having done anything wrong. Now, I, there is a great deal of resistance to the view that uh, uh, Judaism and Kafka's Jewishness in Prague shaped his being and his writing. And the resistance is understandable uh, without drawing any uh, blasphemous uh, analogies. Uh, the Jewishness of Jesus is also often comes as a shock to people. But the fact of the matter is that he uh, Judaism, in the widest and in the most untheological sense of the word, was not only the key to Kafka's destiny, but also the nexus between his life and his work. Now, what did it mean to grow up as a Jew in, in the Prague, in Prague of 1900? It meant, first of all, being afflicted with what I would call the negative identity. That is to say, it's an identity defined for you rather than by you. The Prague Jew, in effect, found himself charged with being a Jew. And he had to plead guilty to the charge without being exactly sure what it was that he pleaded guilty to. Because he, for most of them, the assimilated middle class, of which the Kafkas were a prime example, Judaism had long since become an empty shell totally devoid of meaning. But elsewhere in Europe, the choice was between assimilating to a majority or not assimilating to a majority. In Prague, the situation was much more complicated. Here, Germans and Czechs were engaged in a life and death struggle for supremacy, and the Jews got caught in the crossfire. The chosen people were forced into the role of the chosen enemy, chosen an enemy to both antagonists, and well before the turn of the century, they found themselves living in a no man's land. The paradigmatic triple alienation of Prague's Jews, being alienated from their past, alienated from themselves, and alienated from their surroundings, became in our own time, I believe, endemic throughout the world in the post-Auschwitz universe, and I think partly at least accounts for the popularity of Kafka, despite very poor translations. Uh, the child, Kafka, grew up knowing what he was not. He was not a Czech, he was not a German. This, by subtraction and by the implacable syllogism of Prague politics, made him a Jew. And most of his life and most of his work can, in my opinion, be read in terms of his search for the meaning of this identity assigned to him by fate and by the unreason of history. I. Obviously, this is one interpretation out of 40,000 others, but uh, I find it the most satisfactory for my own purposes, and I think Kafka, like almost any great author, including the Bible, uh, can be made to prove almost anything, and has been made to prove almost anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then a, um, a question. Um, 
When the original manuscript of the trial came to light uh, in 1988, I believe, I mean the original manuscript, not the published text, uh, there was some speculation about Max Brotz having mixed up the order of the chapters uh, of the typescript edition when he submitted Kafka's work for publication in 1924-25 after Kafka's death. What eventually became of this speculation? Do the, the versions that we have, the version that, that we have, reflect uh, this reality or what? What's your... Well, it's quite hopeless. It uh, the version that uh, Max Broad had was in the, which didn't come to light. It, we, we knew all, it, all along where it was. It was in the Tel Aviv kitchen, uh, Esther Hoffa's kitchen in Tel Aviv uh, for I don't know how many years. Uh, nobody had access to it. When the scholars finally fell upon it, uh, they did what they could and what uh, German scholars will do. They spent 10 years or 20 years plucking it, no, not that much, 10 years, I think, plucking it apart and uh, deciding that Max Brod had made some mistakes, which is quite possible. Max Brod made many mistakes in his life. But uh, this is uh, the version we now have. It's a satisfactory version. I personally and I don't know whether you agree with me, but I personally don't think it makes a heck of a lot of difference. Lee, did you get <clears throat> to see the manuscript? I haven't seen the manuscript. I worked with the type. I worked with the typescript of the New German edition, which is a text critical edition to which okay. Ernst is referring. And I, I guess I would agree. I don't think it makes a lot of difference. The, the, the there were two problems. I mean, one is that the the trial is unfinished, as are all three of Kafka's novels. And for the trial, what we have is 10 chapters that, uh, roughly speaking, seem to be finished. One of, that, one of those 10 is long enough to be a full chapter, but it clearly has not been brought to a satisfactory conclusion. I mean, speaking from Kafka's point of view. And then there are half a dozen chapters that are two or three pages long and that are clearly fragments. And so the real issue of the ordering was where these fragments belonged in the overall run of the, uh, the manuscript. The, the scholars who prepared the new text critical edition agree with, with uh, Max Brod's version, which has Kafka, uh, Joseph K. being arrested at the beginning of the book and being executed at the end. And again, the textual or manuscript evidence suggests that Kafka wrote the first and the last chapters to, in sequence and then went back and filled in, wrote the other chapters to, to, to make the story. Uh, the unfinished chapters are part of that process. And the new text critical edition, which took many years to prepare, looks a lot like Max Brod's version. There are problems at the, at the, in, at the level of the individual sentence words that, that, that Kafka misused and that Brod corrected for his friend uh, in the early editions. And th that sort of thing, I think, is, is worth getting straight. I mean, it's worth going back to the manuscript to, to see exactly what Kafka was doing there. But the, the trial as we knew it, at least in German over the years, is, I think, going to be the trial that we know mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future as well. That, that hasn't changed. <clears throat> Did this question of the order have an impact on the way you set about your work in rendering a new translation? No, the, uh, the, I, was, I have to say I was frightened of translating the trial because, and this goes back to your original question, I think you can't translate unless you become totally immersed in the world of the work that you're translating. And I, you know, my view of the world is not Kafkaesque. Uh, so facing this text, I, I hesitated for a period of several weeks trying to decide how I was going to start it. And finally decided I would translate the first and last chapters first. That I'd have it over with. I, you know, he would get killed, and you know, and I could, you know, I could, I could deal with it after that. And about three days after I finished translating the first and the last chapter, the auction happened at Sotheby's, where the manuscript was was sold for uh, one mil, yeah, one million, one point ninety eight million. I think it was close to two million dollars. And in the Times article that was written on the sale, Malcolm Paisley, the man who prepared the text critical edition, said, that was the first I knew of this, that that was the way Kafka had written the book, first and last chapters first. So that whatever it was that made, if it was just fear that made me translate that way, in fact, it seems to have corresponded to the way Kafka wrote the book. Uh, and, you know, that's the sort of thing that you, I think you have to pick up. If you can't do that with a translation, you probably shouldn't be translating. 
<laughs> well, most people shouldn't be translating. Uh, there are uh, three <laughs> types of translators in this country. Uh, the ones that don't know the original but do know English, those that know, Eng know the original but don't know English, and those that don't, don't know either. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> It's present uh, company I'm excluded. I'm sure. Well, no, no. He's he's the exception. It's uh, 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 very unfortunate that he's not a professional translator, but it's quite characteristic. Uh, it doesn't pay. You cannot afford to have a uh, uh, good translators. Unlike uh, in many European countries where this is a real profession, uh, it pays much worse. This is a package economy, uh, where the package counts for more than the content as we all know, and the book jacket usually is more expensive than the translator. Uh, the publishers will put a lot more money into the jacket than into the translation on the hmm. assumption that the public doesn't know the difference anyway. And on the evidence, they've been selling Kafka for 50 years now in, in, in the present <laughs> version, so uh, they're, they're probably right. Uh, Kafka left orders for his writings to be burned after his death by his friend Max Brot. Uh, and this was an instruction, fortunately, that Brot ignored. What do you think was on Kafka's mind? Well, I don't think he really meant for Brot to follow those instructions to begin with. If, okay. if he had wanted those instructions followed, he would either have burned them himself, he did burn a, a lot of manuscripts, apparently, or else he would have given them to somebody else. He knew perfectly well Brot, as a matter of fact, told him that he wasn't going to burn them, so that was a safe bet for him. Well, let me follow that up with... Um, Another point on a similar line, most writers are seeking some kind of immortality in the products of their work. Therefore, the notion that they should be burned would be, uh, would be a criminal notion. Um, and yet there is preserved a brief entry of Kafka's on suicide and his sense of being a failure at everything. He says, and I quote, speaking of himself, you can't do anything. You who can't do anything think you can bring off something like that? How can you even dare to think about it? If you were capable of it, you, you certainly <laughs> wouldn't be in need of it. Well, that was Did Kafka think of himself as that much of a failure? Oh, I think so. I think he, uh, he did think of himself as a failure in many ways, but at the same time, it's amazing how competent he was in many other ways. He was a very competent uh, insurance executive. He was quite competent in many other ways. And uh, I often have the feeling, you know, he died at the age of 41. He took a long time growing up, a very long time growing up, even leaving the house. Uh, he, in the last few years of his life, he apparently really went out of himself. He had a relationship first with Milena Yesenska, who was the first woman, more or less, on his level uh, with Dora Diamond. Uh, I think that had he lived, he would have uh, uh, let a, oh, I, you know, which of us leads a normal life, but I mean as, as normal as the rest of us, mm -hmm. uh, or a little less normal. But I think that the, 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 the pathological aspects of Kafka have been vastly exaggerated, by himself, by the way. But this is partly due to the fact that uh, we base it on diaries. Now, all of you, I don't think people nowadays keep diaries anymore, but by and large, people write in their diaries when they're down, when they're depressed, when they're, something extraordinary happens and so on, and then there are long stretches where nothing happens and you don't fill out the diary. You look at the diary and you see you know, nothing but a, a succession of miseries and, 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 and horrors and so on and so forth. I, his life wasn't like that, and I don't think uh, we should judge it. Uh, but, I, but I think the real question here is, you say he might have lived a normal life if he had lived longer. The question is whether normal life means he would have stopped writing. That's possible. Uh, I, he considered. I mean, he he thought it might. Yes. Yeah. I, I, it uh, seems to me there was the, he was he was very ambivalent both he about didn't, his. He uh, didn't, in fact, write during the last few years, right. of, except in in Berlin. And, and I th I think he was ambivalent about his literary output. I think he felt that uh, there were times he had this very clear notion of himself as a writer. I mean, this was a career that he wanted, and you know, having manuscripts was part of it. Having manuscripts published was part of it. And at the same time, I think he felt that, first of all, what he was publishing or write, what he was writing wasn't very good, and, mm -hmm. and the novels were a problem there. I mean, they were not finished. He knew they weren't finished. Uh, and beyond that, I th he was, I suspect, rather ambivalent about the word. That presents an interesting problem, it seems to me, to you as a translator. In other words, if the author wasn't satisfied with his product, felt that his product was a failure, didn't 
communicate what he was trying to say. You as a translator are not only a translator, you're also, quotes, an interpreter of his meaning. Yeah. If he couldn't get to it, what gives you the presumption to think you could get to it in yet another language? Uh, you know, the curious thing is that Kafka saw himself, I think, at times as a translator. Uh, his works were translations of something for which there was no original. And that's one of the reasons he was so frustrated, because he felt that he had botched it, that he hadn't gotten it right. And for me, it was a little bit easier because, all right, so I come along, I'm a translator, but at least I have the original. Mm -hmm. It's imperfect by the author's uh, standards, but it was, it's there for me, and so I can work with that. It was tough, though, because at the linguistic level, what you see is this constant sort of indecision. Sentence by sentence in the German, there, there is a, a variation in style, uh, in word choice, sometimes in rhythm, that, that, that is one of the things that demurs did away with. I mean, they, they sculpted a very nice English, and, and in the process, did away with a lot of this uncertainty in the, in the Kafka narrative. And I, came, I came in and felt that one of the things I was going to have to do was to capture that indecision about whether we were really talking German or writing German, and whether we knew who the narrator really was. Was it K? Was it some omniscient person? Was it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not clear. And it, you can actually find sentences in the trial where you see Kafka starting out to write it one way and in the middle of the sentence deciding that that's not the way it's going to happen and changing it. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, all right, well, so what do you do with it in English? You, because the editor is going to say, this doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. It's your fault, the translator's fault, right? And you have to say, well, but that's the way it is in the original. And, and this could go on sentence by sentence for 70,000 words. It's, you know, <laughs> it's a real undertaking. Well, I so. also think that uh, you misstate the problem somewhat by wondering about his way of communicating. It wasn't uppermost in his mind to communicate with other people. That did not really... He, he, he wrote when he was gripped by the genius or whatever it was by the spirit when the spirit was upon him and when the spirit was not upon him he didn't write for two years three years at a time mm -hmm. he complained about it was easy to to blame the office he said i you know here i am I'm, I'm i'm a writer and i have to get up in the morning and go to work and can't i can't work at night actually the office is what kept him alive i think he it made him get out of bed in the morning and uh, he did write when he was working and when he wasn't working when he was uh, later on when he was on, on on leave and so on and so forth he did practically no writing in the sanatorium we had all the time in the world for years and years and years he didn't write a thing uh he he was not that that's why i'm saying there's a difference between a genius and a talent. He was not a professional writer who writes every day, sits down and writes every day. He wrote when he had to write, and when he didn't have to write, then he didn't write. But right. He was unhappy when, he, when, he, when it wasn't there. But. And, that, and that might not be representative of the, of the rhythm of everyday life for such a person, is what you're also saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it seems to me, that for people of, of my generation, um, we grew up with a sense of, uh, of great awe about Kafka. And, um, you know, for instance, uh, by way of analogy, today the marketplace is being flooded with new translations of the Holy Scriptures, and it's setting off all kinds of resonations, both in the churches and synagogues and in uh, the halls of literature and so on and so forth. Uh, some people complain that they're losing something that they once had, a certain uh, manner of speech, uh, certain idioms that just uh, are part of our, our manner of speech in Western culture, or what have you. Um, and at the same time, uh, is, are we in danger of having something like that? Are we going to have Kafka taken away from us, uh, those of us who felt that he was apocalyptic in his visions and dark and grim and had a certain aspect of messianic a apprehension waiting for the end and yet it never arrives? And I mean, well, is he, that going to be go away too? He hasn't been sanctified yet, I mean. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it's still in flux. No, I think... Uh, it's vital to have a different translation and a better translation. No translation, obviously, can ever do justice to the original, but that is true of almost any translation. There's always something lost because languages are not exact analogies and you can't, you, can't, you know, it's, it's partly, it's a judgment call on the part of the translator whether to be literal or whether to be colloquial or so on and so forth. But uh, I think 
new translations are important, but I don't think they're going to change very much because I'm not quite sure what Kafka's fame really consists of. I find that most of the people who know something about him and know a little bit about his life and so on have never read him. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, you know, does it make a difference whether the trial, the new edition of the trial will have two pages different or, uh, I don't think it will, except for German pedants, just as the new, new edition of Ulysses. I mean, for most of us who read Ulysses so many years ago, the new edition really doesn't add anything, and I don't think it makes any difference, except to scholars. And of course, Kafka is very important in the academic world, as you no doubt know. Uh -huh. uh, he's been appropriated, and uh, sure. uh, just because of the fact that it is the kind of text that lends itself to many different interpretations, of course. Uh, it, it's ideal for PhD uh, theses and so on and so forth, and there are <laughs> literally thousands of them. Well, Lee, you gave us an example already, uh, and I personally very much like the way you changed that by touching what you thought was the, the thrust of that sentence rather than right. a mere temporal detail, which, uh, you know, was by the by. Um, as as an American, a native of the English language, uh, who is, uh, let's say, well, part of my generation, a bit younger, but part of my generation. Were there words, idioms, were there things that you had to find, that you had a struggle to find a way to communicate that to an audience of English read of the English reading public today uh, that uh, challenged you particularly? No, I don't think there were there were what there there was a class of words. I, I guess I have to admit admit this, and that they are words that are used in German to color uh, the language, to color narrative. Short words, ja, doch, noch, uh, übrigens, that Kafka uses quite noticeably. I mean, that German authors do, or German language authors do use. Uh, in Kafka, they struck me as particularly evident, and they also struck me as something, and this, critics have commented on this, words that the Muirs had simply eliminated. Right. <clears throat> it seemed to me that there was a kind of nervousness about, about Kafka's style that, that these words summed up. And so in the translation, I felt that I had to capture them and make them as salient in the English as I felt they were in the German. Mm -hmm. But I, beyond that, it seems to me that what the Muirs did was to theologize Kafka. And that is it's this, the source of the interpretations that ha have Joseph K, a hero who is looking for God but can't, you know, is faced with the absent God. As I read Kafka, and this may just be that I was doing it at the end of the, uh, the 1980s, Joseph K. came off as, as something of a yuppie. I mean, this is a, a, you know, a guy who has a, a, it says in the novel, he's had a meteoric rise in the, in the, uh, in the bank where he's, he's working. Uh, he lives by himself. He's got friends, but they don't really matter. What matters is his career. And when you, when you see a protagonist like that, you say, well, maybe he's not so much of a hero. Maybe God isn't really a significant player in this, in this universe. And I think that, that for Kafka, that's true. Mm. That's Absolutely. I, I agree, but Max Brod is primarily responsible yeah. for the theological interpretation. Brod, quite late in life, found God and uh, then reread his Kafka and edited him, edited him accordingly. Hmm. And made him the uh, the God seeker and uh, uh, late comer to uh, to to Judaism and so on. There's a great deal to be said about this. Nothing for it, I think, but it uh, it's become very fashionable. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, there is uh, there are several books out that see in him as a as seeking not just God but Jesus, and uh, hmm. uh, uh, that this is really the search for 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 Christ. Uh, that you can, as I said, you can read almost anything into these books and it's very easy to do so. And there's no justification for it whatsoever and as far as I know, uh, Kafka never uh, reverted to the god of his ancestors uh, one way or another, although he was profoundly interested in, in Judaism toward the end of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I said, the, the, it's, it's yeah. Broad who, who, who introduced that. Let me read you another quote 
and see your reaction to this. Uh, this quote was uh, uttered um, just this year in May by uh, none other than Vaclav Havel, uh, the uh, new president of uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, it was reported uh, in the Jerusalem Post, uh, his remarks before the Hebrew University when he spoke there this year. And uh, we are told that uh, he viewed himself as a very Kafkaesque personality. Um, he felt himself a projection of the guilt-ridden, ambiguous, absurd characters that inhabit the world of Franz Kafka. Describing the Kafkaesque characteristics he himself repeatedly experienced, Havel cited, quote, a feeling of deep shame as if my existence were a sin, end quote. In addition, he said he felt an alienation from his surroundings, a heavy sense of being strangled, and a constant need to explain and defend himself. Quote once again, the feeling of alienation is a wise feeling. It is the hidden motive of all my efforts. The desperate search for a higher law is what draws me to unreasonable adventures. I would even dare to say that if and when I have done anything good, it has stemmed apparently from a desire to overcome a metaphysical sense of guilt. Nor would I be surprised if I suddenly heard the cry, wake up, and found myself back in prison explaining to my cellmates all that had happened to me in the past six months. So I ask you, does Havel have a good take on Kafka, or does he tell us more about Havel? Well, I think Havel is a, is a, is a Jew, more of a Jew than, than, <laughs> than many, many a Jew. No, I think he has a good take on, he is a Kafkaesque character, and I think it is interesting that uh, uh, he exerts the tremendous moral force that he does today, and I think largely by virtue of the fact that he has a sense of himself as totally alienated. And yes, he, uh, he is an outsider. And mm -hmm. of course, as an outsider, this is, happens to be an advantage at this particular moment in Czech history. Right. I think it's a tough one, though, because uh, he uses the word defensive to describe himself. Uh, in line with what I was just saying about, about how Kafka sees Joseph K., I would probably have to say further that, that Joseph K. is defensive because he also knows that he is offensive. That is, he knows that he is not, he doesn't treat people decently. Mm -hmm. And so he feels guilty. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one point. The second thing, uh, the, uh, the word sin, I think, has heavy theological connotations, and I don't buy that. I mean, I just don't think that's that's guilt part of the, is the word, but we invented guilt. I mean, sin, sin, sin came after sin. It's a sin different is the, sin, is, sin is the different testament, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to monopolize this, and uh, I want to give you who've come tonight an opportunity to address your questions. I would ask you, please, to not follow my bad example and try to keep your questions brief so that I can then, if necessary, summarize them. And can I ask our staff to bring the house lights up just a bit so I can uh, see the audience? All right, this gentleman with his hand up in the front third row. Uh, Mr. Powell, I was wondering, after all the years that you studied Kafka, to what extent do you actually think you know him? I mean, how much, how much do you get to know someone if you've read everything and studied that long? How much do you think you actually know him? Question is, uh, Mr. Powell, who spent quite a number of years devoting himself to the study of this man, how well does he actually feel he knows Kafka at this point? Well, the answer, the short answer is I have the slightest idea. None of us really knows the other. Uh, there is a subjective element, and what I know about Kafka and the way I experience Kafka is radically different from uh, what, um, Ne not necessarily radically different, but different from what anybody else would experience. Uh, this is a, one of the re many reasons why different biographies will always stress different aspects of uh, personality. Uh, you do your best, but your best is not nearly good enough because we can't, well, we can't even know ourselves, let alone somebody else. And that, uh, you know, that. The mystery of personality ultimately right. precludes that, I guess. All right, yes, gentleman in the back, and then this lady next. Yes, you're with the hand up. Yes, sir.
That's uh, a very technical question, which uh, I'm not going to try to uh, respond to. Do you want to take that? Well, I'm uh, not quite sure I get the question, but let me, let me put it this way. If you read in the penal colony or even the beginning of the trial, they have a universality which your own particular neurosis or psychosis may or may not have. Uh, whether it is worth exploring, I can't tell you, but uh, it evidently does elicit a response in a great many people. Uh, uh, what else is there? I think that I think in part I was, that's what I was um, hinting at when I said that uh, his works took on an almost scriptural quality for many people in my generation, in that. The same as uh, one can look into scripture and that find there a model for uh, you fill in your own details, but the structures are certainly uh, they resonate for so many people. And I, I um, maybe his experience wasn't horrifying enough for you compared to your own experience. Yes, the the lady. Yes, in the yes. Please stand up if you don't mind, so we can hear you better. The question had to do with uh, Professor Haffrey's remarks about the changes in voice, in mood, in tone, in choice of word that was so apparent uh, in the original uh, German and the challenges that that represented. And where does uh, Professor Haffrey think that came from? Was it a, a matter of uh, that he couldn't communicate the thought or that it was a, a problem of trying to decide style? Or is it a reflection of the fact that the manuscript itself is so incomplete we can't finally know? what the problem was. I, I don't want to beg the question. I, what I tell my students often is that there, you, you can solve these issues of incompleteness two ways. You can take the high road. You know, you've got a concept. You want to think it through, and then you'll be able to say it properly. Uh, the alternative is to write a correct English sentence, and if you manage to do that, probably it will help you clarify your thinking. And so you can take it two ways, and I'm not sure where Kafka was in that picture. What I think is more interesting is the question whether there was real deliberation in this incompleteness sentence by sentence. Mm. That is, whether he felt, and he was very conscious of the literary tradition, uh, whether he felt that it was his duty to subvert that tradition and whether the open-endedness, to use a word that's been offered, uh, the open-endedness of his text was something that he strove for, so that what we call an unfinished manuscript may in fact have been exactly what he wanted. Now there are biographical details that suggest this is not the case, that is that you know, he writes about how he couldn't get more than a page or two out. That doesn't sound like completion, and he made comments that made it clear that he thought it was incomplete. On the other hand, you know, I think that one of the reasons we are so interested in Kafka is because he did produce these things that were incomplete texts that effectively destroyed our notion of what it means to have well-made art. Hmm. I think one of the real values he has given us, I mean, this is in the 20th century, is the sense that you know, there are different ways of, of thinking and different ways of communicating, and that the, the novel that we had had since the 18th century no longer worked. It means it didn't convey the truth as we had come to see it. And the best he could do, and I think he was aware of this, was to give us something that was incomplete. Mm. Yes, on the end, and then this gentleman. Would you mind standing? It helps to other people to hear.
A question is what attracted Mr. Powell to uh, his work on this biography and what point in his life did he decide that it was a task uh, that he should attend himself to and uh, also that there's a rendering of the trial playing in the West End these days. Uh, I'm not aware of the rendering of the trial. What attracted me was that I left Germany as a 13-year-old as a, as a in 1933 and spent the next four and a half years as a refugee in Europe, and if there ever was a Kafkaesque existence, that was it. I worked in a bookstore, and I came across the works of Kafka in 1935 and 1936, and I've been interested in them ever since. I went to Prague in 1978, and uh, the, the nexus between Kafka and the city itself is so obvious and so striking that uh, that started me on the biography. Good. Yes, gentleman in the sweatshirt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I wanted to ask, why do you think that it's important, or why do people kind of, in a way, attack Kafka so much and go beyond his words and past what he has written and try to rationalize why he wrote it or weld it into fitting their own framework of their mind as opposed to just letting the words speak for themselves? I think that's a brilliant question by a young man, and it's a tribute to the fact that despite uh, uh, English faculties and deconstructionist <laughs> theorems and so on and so forth, uh, a, a certain spirit still survives and, and is impervious to all these ministrations. <laughs> uh, just for a reference, are, are you really from Sarah Lawrence? Yes. Oh, there, that explains it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Haffer, you want to get in on this? <laughs> well, yeah, well, I think what I said about the incompleteness of Kafka is part of the answer. That is, you've got this text, this book that is clearly not finished, and it says, finish me. And so people do it, and they're invariably wrong, but that doesn't stop anyone. I think that's, that's the fun of it. And, you know, a lot of the art that's happened since, since Kafka's death has played off of the same notion that fragmentary art has this drawing power uh, and you know it, it continues to sell. I would agree except for one fact I don't think he was conscious of it. I do oh, not. No, that's possible. Uh, I, I think that this was something that was done instinctively and that it's true it's this search this quest for something that he could never find that's so important and uh, as a matter of fact uh, recently in Prague people asked me what is there in Kafka for the new generation of Czechs who have no idea of what it was, who know the name but have never read any of his books? And I think the only thing that I could come up with was the fact that he was a man who had no certainties, no givens, that he did not take anything for granted. And in that respect, Havel is a very similar character. He did not, he is perpetually in quest and doesn't, unlike the old communist commissars who had all the answers, he doesn't, he, have a lot of, he has a lot of questions. He rarely ever comes up with an answer. Some, uh, some uh, critics have suggested that, that uh, if we deal with Kafka as an allegorist, uh, his break with the past tradition of allegory comes in this point that you've just mentioned, that with most allegorists, we can find the key, as it were, in the outside world, in the culture, in the past, that, as it were, bore them and, and, uh, and shaped them. And once we get that key, we can figure out what the individual symbols mean. Whereas Kafka seems to have generated these images out of his own imagination, out of his own unconscious, um, and therefore remains much more difficult to penetrate because it is so personalized. Um, I want to get over to this side, this lady, and then on the aisle next. Hi, this is Mr. Powell. Um, I guess it's not really a question, but perhaps more of a comment. I just wonder if you want to say anything. I was very much struck by uh, your book in the sense of uh, the things I've read on Kafka before have been such intellectual, um, pardon me, but masturbation of the person who was writing it. I learned more about the person writing it than I did about Kafka. And I was struck by your artistic acceptance of the genius versus the intellectual uh, intellectualization of that genius. And was this a conscious effort on your part as a biographer? 
question was, again, words of admiration for Mr. Powell's book, The Nightmare of Reason, and uh, the difference that uh, this person observes between his handling of the subject, namely his commitment to delivering the person of uh, Kafka to us rather than indulging in his own theories about what Kafka means and tending to explore his own thinking more than that of the life of the person whom he's addressing. Well, to the extent that the conscious is really a rationalization of the unconscious, I think we, uh, uh, I can't draw the line there. I don't know which, which came first, but uh, thank you for the compliment. Yes, on the aisle. Mm-hmm. German. He wrote in German. In fact, I asked the question before in my naivete. I said, if a Czech today, a Prager, wanted to read, uh, read Kafka, would he have to read it in German? Or in a, would he have to read it in a Czech translation? And apparently he'd have to read it in a Czech translation, more than likely, given the culture of Czechoslovakia today. But that was true even in, in, even his, then. Day, even in his day. The Czechs, by and large, did not speak German. Some the young German spoke, uh, spoke Czech broad, and he and Kafka himself spoke Czech. But uh, uh, they didn't read German. And it's interesting that the German, however, the Germans, today's Germans read Kafka without any difficulty and with great pleasure because mm. his style is rather different from the pedantic, uh, uh, convoluted style of the German classics. Kafka has become a German classic. Huh. That's fascinating. Uh, yes, I'll continue back along the aisle and then this side again. Yes, straight back on the, yes, all right, second in from the aisle. Okay, the question is, in his later life especially, Kafka apparently had a, some yearning to actually go to then Palestine, and that he might have been influenced by Zionism in some way, and did Mr. Powell find any influence, any indication of that in any of uh, uh, Kafka's experiences or writing? He was fascinated by Zionism. He was never a Zionist. He said that he wasn't a Zionist, but he took Hebrew lessons with a uh, woman who is still alive today in Jerusalem, as far as I know, uh, Pua Ben Tavim and uh, uh, even wanted to, had plans to go to, to Palestine to join Hugo Berg, his friend Hugo Bergman, who invited him. But of course, with Zionism, as with everything else, he t had his distance. He, he couldn't be part of any particular movement. He encouraged his sister, his sister uh, Atla to go to Hachshara farming in, in, in in Czechoslovakia somewhere at the point at that time, and he had many friends. All most of his friends were Zionists. The Max Brod be, had become a Zionist, and uh, Hugo Bergman. Uh, uh, what's the other? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, whether it influenced his writing is difficult to say. Josephine the singer is that the title of it in English? Josephine the singer can be seen as a um, the the mouse folk can be seen as an allegorical tale of the return or the, the uh, re restitution of some kind of, you, you can read Zionism into it if you want to, as you can read, Zion, read a lot of things into it, but that's as far as it goes. The fact of the matter is that Kafka never once mentioned Jews in any of his fiction. He mentioned it plenty mm. in his diaries and in his letters and so on and so forth. And this has led people to say that, well, this is all uh, hogwash. I mean, he had no real contact with Jews, which is not true. There's an apocryphal, I don't know how, whether it's apocryphal or true, perhaps you can clear it up, the story that uh, his fantasy and his, his later days in Berlin uh, were that he would get well, he would go to Palestine, he would open up a restaurant with Dora, she would cook, and he would become the waiter. That's right. Uh, there are lo there's still lots of restaurants like that in You know, I, <laughs> I have days like that too, you know. I mean, was that, is that real? <laughs> well, Dora was, of course, came from his Hasidic family. She spoke fluent Hebrew and Yiddish, and uh, uh, actually her family did end up in Palestine in the end. But, uh, uh, yeah, he had fantasies like that, okay. of course. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll take one or two more questions. All right, we'll come back to this side. All the way in the back. Yes, yes, you still have your hand up. Go ahead. No date has been scheduled.
Right, was everyone able to hear? When, when, when will the book be published? The publication date hasn't been set as yet. Um, on then, what about the question of the representation of women in the trial? And does the new translation do anything to change that imagery? I think what I, what I said about uh, Joseph Case being offensive stems from the way he treats the women in the trial, and I can't change that. Okay. okay. That's fair. All right. Yes, coming forward. Yes, you, you, with the gold chain. Yes. Uh, Captain, I was also interested in the initiative. Uh, and some people say that there's a connection between the stories of the Bratislava Rebbe and the tales of the Kafka. Was he familiar with uh, initiative ritual and the tales? The question has to do with possibility of Kafka's awareness of the, some of the tales of the Bratislava Rebbe. Rav Nachman of Bratislava told extremely uh, complex allegorical tales, and his writings are preserved for us now in English translation. Uh, several uh, versions are available. Uh, does anyone know whether there was uh, a connection in his knowledge of Yiddish or anything of that yeah, sort? Well, he didn't know any Yiddish, Kafka did. But uh, he, yes, he was fascinated with the Yiddish theater in 1912, not so much as, as theater as the the sense of, for the first time he had a sense that here were Jews who were Jews the way the Czechs are Czech or the Germans are Germans. They didn't have any problems of identity, which is of course true of ghetto Jews. He idealized the ghetto, he romanticized the ghetto as many people do, did subsequently of course. Uh, he was fascinated with uh, Yiddish literature. He read it in translation. Martin Buber uh, was the first one to uh, publish German translations of the tales of the rabbi. Uh, and uh, yes, he was familiar with these things, uh, whether it entered his consciousness. I mean, I've always felt that he was, in, in, a, in a sense, an heir to the Talmudists and Kabbalists of Prague. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, his whole manner, approach, and so on and so forth is very Talmudic. But I think this, again, is more unconscious. Uh, he was not a person to pick up mm -hmm. influences directly. Mm -hmm. For those who might be interested in reading any of these tales of Rav Nachman of Bratislav, there are two good renderings, one by uh, Arthur Green, uh, Rav Nachman of Bratislav, a tormented master, uh, is the name of that one, and there's also a book uh, uh, in the uh, Classics of Western Spirituality series put out um, that deals with these Hasidic tales, also a Rav Nachman of Bratislav. Yes, uh, all right, two more, this lady and that gentleman. No, no, absolutely not. I think I would have shot myself if I tried to do that. It's really, no, I mean, I did read both translations before I set about the work I was doing, but I read them, I think, probably three to four months before I actually sat down to translate, and at that point, what I had in mind was the German, which was, as I said earlier, the typescript of the manuscript of the new text critical edition that just came out about six, eight months ago in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In the perception of fantasy, do you think that alienation and suffering and, and morality go together hand in hand? Would you repeat that once again? Sorry. In the perception of fantasy, do you think alienation and morality go hand in hand? Or do you think that alienation and suffering bring on morality? Yes, well. <laughs> That's the rabbinical question. I was going to say, I'll be glad to discuss that with you in the lobby after the show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you have enjoyed this program, which brings about an interpenetration of the world's great literature with Jewish life and culture, I would like to take just a moment to refer you to Sunday, March 3rd, when we will have as our all-day guest the world-famous poet and author Yehuda Amichai. Uh, it's part of our Everett Omnibus Institute program, and it's an opportunity to sit with the author in a day-long study of his own writings and that of other modern masters of Hebrew literature. Thank Thank you for coming, and I look forward to seeing you soon.
Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. <laughs>